Happy Friday, everyone. Welcome to Somewhere in the Middle with Michelle Berard. I'm your host, Michelle Berard, founder and CEO of Urban Book Editor and Michelle A. Berard, LLC. And I'm really happy to share this hour with you, where we examine all those places where spirit meets life and the joys and challenges that may bring. Now, I hope everybody's doing well, still getting through this pandemic. You know, things are different, but in some ways they remain the same. Change is the only constant. So just, you know, stay focused on what's good in life and be safe. Do all those things that we need to do to take care of ourselves because we can't rely on other people to take care of us. You guys know I like to start by thanking Ms. Beverly Black and Tribe Family Channel for helping me create this space for us. Tribe Family Channel is home to an assortment of thought-provoking shows that explore life, spirit, business, and culture, including The Woman at the Well, hosted by Ms. Beverly Black herself. Somewhere in the Middle was born on Tribe Family Channel. And though we've grown onto our own platform, we are ever grateful and loyal to our roots. To paraphrase an African proverb, we are here only because we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. I want to say thank you to my guest on the August 21st show, author Nicholas Mays. You can connect with Nicholas on social media. If you miss that show, make sure you listen to the replay. You can find our complete show archives, including the August 21st show at the somewhere in the middle podcast.com. I also want to shout out Bruce George of the genius is common movement, which encourages all of us to embrace our inner genius and share it with the world. This is a really important message and especially for the youth, but not just for the kids. You guys know that sometimes we adults need to be reminded that the world needs our genius. Learn more about the Genius is Common movement at www.geniusiscommon.com. Now, I had such an interesting conversation with this week's guest. He's, he's a really interesting guy. B.G. Howard was born and raised in the small town of Baxley, Georgia, where he graduated from high school before relocating to Macon. There, he attended college at Mercer University, though circumstances prevented him from completing his degree. B.G. now resides in Jacksonville, where he suffered an automobile accident several years ago, leaving him classified as clinically disabled. He considers the extensive injuries he sustained as a blessing in disguise. This incident opened the opportunity for him to embark on a new career as an author. A state and national award-winning newspaper columnist before the accident, B.G. Howard resumed his efforts writing an opinion column for the hometown Baxley News Banner in September 2015. He also writes philosophy, poetry, and short stories. As B.G. says, there's so much occupying the space inside my head. Writing is simply a mandatory outlet. So I'd like to welcome B.G. Howard to Somewhere in the Middle with Michelle Berard. BG, thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me. So I like to start my interviews with two questions, and it's because it really, I think, kind of opens us up to learning more about what you do and, and why you do it. So I'm going to ask those two questions if you're ready. Yes, ma'am. BG Howard, who are you, and how did you become who you are today? Wow. Well. Well, to be very honest with you, I had an accident several years ago and I lost my memory, so I'm still trying to figure out who I am. Uh, at this point in my life, I'm, I'm resolved to be a writer. Writing for me is a hobby. For me, it has actually proven to be a necessity. There are times that I have not been able to write, and uh, remarkably, <laughs> I actually suffer physical issues, such as headaches or uh, insomnia. I, I, I have to write. I don't know what it is. I just have to write. And when did this start? When Were you a writer before? Do you know that? Or let me Actually, let me back up and ask a question. You said you had an accident. Yes, ma'am. And you lost your memory. Yes, ma'am. How does that work? So you, you, you know, I've seen on the movies, you know, they, somebody has amnesia and they wake up and 
family or friends come and they're trying to talk to them and they're like kind of freaked out. Like, I don't know who you are. What are you saying to me? Um, what's that like? What's that whole process? What, what happens? Well, you've heard the phrase, you've heard the phrase art imitates or uh, art imitates life and life imitates art. Mm -hmm. Essentially that's what happens. (laughs) Uh, The best example that I could give anyone, um, I saw a movie called, um, 50 first dates. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's essentially my life without the, the, the young man. Um, I, um, woke up one day and couldn't get out of bed. Didn't know where I was. Didn't know what had happened. People came in and started talking to me and I was trying to figure out who they were. Um, Long story short, I was in a rehab facility. Um, found out that I was um, riding, actually was riding my brother's bike. Um, three, 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 three blocks from home. And the, uh, a, a, a wrecker, a flatbed wrecker pulled out in front of me. Oh. So I, I slammed into the side of the truck. Mm-hmm. Um, I did have a passenger. Um, Emily, who was actually one of the people who worked at the office with me. Um, she fortunately didn't get too badly hurt. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it broke, broke her pelvis and one of her arms, one of her legs, and I think her collarbone or something like that. Um, I, on the other hand, <laughs> thankfully took the brunt of it because I was on the front and I couldn't have lived with myself if she had gotten hurt worse. But um, anyway. I broke both my ankles, both my shins, both my knees, both my femurs, my pelvis in three places, both my upper arms, both my elbows, both my forearms, and both my wrists. Wow. And I had a massive concussion that left me in a coma for seven months. Ooh. And so you woke up in a rehab facility not knowing what day it was, not knowing where you were. When did you realize that you didn't know who you were? When, when I turned to one of the individuals in the, in, the, in the room and I asked them, who are you? Where am I? In fact, can you tell me who I am? And that began a very lengthy, laborious process of me trying to get back to who I am. And, you know, all these years later, I'm still trying to figure out sometimes who I am. So um, it's really weird because I have a god sister in, in New York, and she told me a story essentially surmising that my life consisted of a great many little circles and I never allowed any of the two circles to intersect. So people who knew me as a biker didn't know me as a businessman and vice versa. Mm. People from church didn't know that I was a biker. People who knew me as a model didn't know that I was a business. You know, it was just the, none of the circles intersected. So there was no overlap. So who, when you had the accident, you were with that young lady yes, ma'am. that you worked with. Yes, ma'am. Who, who was at your hospital bed? Who was at, at, the, at your side when you woke up? The emergency contact, because of course they have an emergency contact list. And uh, they notified my parents, because I live in Jacksonville, Florida. Mm-hmm. And they notified my parents who live a couple hours away in, in Georgia. Mm-hmm. And they eventually it filtered out and all the necessary people, all the people that had to be in the know showed up in the, at the hospital. I was asleep for seven months, so I didn't know who was there. Mm. And when you woke up, it was rehab center staff that was there? Mm, yes, ma'am. 
And who was the first person who came to see you? Mm. You know, I never thought about that. I think it was, um, I think it was my, it was either my mother or my, my older sister, because my, my older sister is a nurse. Okay. And she had actually come down from, I think, Atlanta. She came down from Atlanta. Uh, she's a hands-on nurse, and she's a hands-on nurse, so she wanted, she wanted to make sure that, you know, they were taking care of me. Right, of course, of course. So she came down to it, and so she, so she and my mother spent uh, a great deal of time at the hospital. So the reason I asked that is I'm curious, what was that first interaction like? You didn't remember her, did yeah. you? No, ma'am. So what was that first interaction like? Who are you? What do you want? What are you doing here? <laughs> I mean, I, I couldn't I couldn't talk um, as well, of course, because at the time I had a um, trach, a tra uh, what do you call it? Called? A trach, 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 tracheotomy. Oh yeah, you had the tracheotomy done. Okay. So yes, I I couldn't. I had to I had to learn how to do everything: eat, uh, talk. And not to be grotesque, but even going to the bathroom, I had to do. Initially, I had to have somebody take me to the bathroom and you know help me. Right. Uh, it was a it was a lengthy process. Right, I imagine. Not something I would wish on my worst enemy. And so, when when your sister or your mother, whoever the first person was, came, you were confused. You were disoriented, and you're like, "Who are you? Why are you here?" What did they do? Did they start telling you stories? Yes, ma'am. That's 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 all they could do is try to try to jar my memory, for lack of a better term. Um, they thought, you know, doctors suggested, you know, that they talked to me and and that you know perhaps it would come back. And after a couple of months, they were like, well, you know, give it up, give it, give it six months. And after six months, they were like, uh, sometimes it takes as much as a year. After a year, like, <laughs> part of the use of the incorrect grammar, but they were like, if he ain't got it now, it ain't not coming back. <laughs> mm, wow. So basically, and, and do you mind if I ask what age you were when you had the accident? Uh, I, I think maybe my early to mid thirties, I'm not sure. I so, have died. it's not because of the accident, but I have trouble keeping up with my, my age now. Well yeah, after a certain age you just don't care about that anymore. <laughs> I have to I have to do math to figure out how old I am now. I'm like, never mind, it's not worth it. Uh, okay. <laughs> I think that's normal. I don't think that's at all related to Oh okay. So so no really much for me on that one. Yeah, I don't think so. I, I don't think that's amnesia related. But no, I ask because so that sounds like you basically lost 30 years of who you are. Yes. So yeah. what does that mean for you as far as the process of reinventing yourself? Well, I'm I live a very very philosophical life. Um I used to literally lose days trying to remember. And in about five years after the accident, I was still trying to put pieces together and nothing made sense. And I was diagnosed later, like I said, five or six years later, with a condition called static encephalopathy. And what is that? Big fancy word for I looked up, of course, Google is my best friend because I have a lot of mm -hmm. questions. Mm -hmm. um, but I looked up when I went to the neurologist and he told me this, he gave me this word. So I come home and I, I jump on the computer and I, I could not find static encephalopathy. I found encephalopathy, which is defined as loss of brain cells due to lack of oxygen at birth. Mm. So I called the neurologist and said, hey, you made a mistake. And he says, uh, he says, why? And I said, because this says a, a, a loss of oxygen, loss of brain cells due to lack of oxygen at birth. I said, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a newborn. And he said, that's why they call it static encephalopathy. 
because it's post mm. And I didn't find out until this is what, 20? I didn't find out until about three, three or four years ago that there was an extended period of time that I was without oxygen to my brain. Wow. Okay. Wow. So life had to start all over again. What does that process look like for you? Do you did you start by like looking at your at pictures? Did it start by going through old documents and trying to, or did you just say, you know what? Now that I know I have this static encephalopathy, I hope I said that correctly. Um, okay. That close enough, I know. And I'm like, I don't even know if I wrote that well because I make notes here and I'm looking. Like going, I don't think that's right. But um, now I've got this diagnosis that means basically I can't get it back. I'm gonna just start from where I am right now. What does what does that whole process look like? Oh, gosh, one of the consequences of the condition. Um, I I I I I, I, I battle. Uh, I mean, I I battle severe bouts of depression, mm -hmm. um, extreme paranoia. Mm -hmm. um, I will I will not, for example, I will not go into a, I, I don't like restaurants. I don't like being out in public. Mm -hmm. But I will not sit with my back to a door. Mm -hmm. Even at home, I don't sit with my back to a door. Mm -hmm. um, it's, oh gosh. Coincidentally, someone asked me, about two days ago to describe, define what it's like. And the assessment, if, if you can imagine being inside a black hole and you fight, you struggle tooth and nail to get to climb out of that, to climb out of that, to climb out of that hole, mm -hmm. only to get to the crevice and realize you're just in a black hole inside of a larger black hole inside of a larger black hole inside of a yet larger black hole and that's mm -hmm. the so you were a newspaper columnist yes ma'am and so when did you decide to fall back on writing? To be honest with you, I was sitting at my computer. Well, I'm okay. I had two businesses. My average work, my average work week was 140 hours. Oof. So if you're going 150 miles per hour, and then all of a sudden you blink and you're at a dead standstill, a dead, a standstill. It's hard to it's hard to get a handle on life. Mm -hmm. And 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 I was I, I I didn't know where to go. I, I didn't know what to do. I had no life. Um, all of all of all of all of my associates, people people who knew me, uh, most of them were business related um, um, or bikers, but I couldn't ride anymore. And then the other thing about it. I didn't. I never let anybody know who I who I. I never let anybody inside. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew where I lived. Even people who worked with me, they said, you know, uh, anytime anybody wanted to meet me or come meet me, most of the time I was at the office. So I just had people come to the office. Mm -hmm. um, nobody knew where my home address was, mm -hmm. and even up until a couple of years ago, when all the when the law when all the laws changed, my License, my driver's license, my address on my driver's license was my PO box. I was very, I, I've come to understand I was very private. I'm still very private. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't let people in very easily. Mm -hmm. But it's a, it's a daily challenge. I, 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 I went from doing everything in the world to doing nothing at all and to 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 try and maintain my sanity or at least retain what little bit that was left um i i ordered uh internet service mm -hmm. so i would 
You go to church on Sunday. You go to Bible study on Wednesday. Um, and uh, beyond that, I surfed the net. Bought a lot of things that I didn't need. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like uh, everyone. <laughs> yeah, really. And then when, ironically, one day this idea came into my mind. And I'm like, what in the world? So I dismissed it. But it continued to come back over the course of the next six, eight weeks. And I'm like, what? It, it wouldn't leave me alone. And I literally got aggravated. And I said, you know, this thing is not going to go away. So I sat at the computer, opened the Word document, and I just started typing. Had no idea what it was. Had no had, had, no, had no direction. I just was typing. And I would do that. Then my godmother lives in New York. Uh, I've got some 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 people that I know in South Florida and other places. So I would go and visit them, and that's like anywhere from three weeks to three months. And when I came back home, I get bored, so I type. And it took me a total of about three years to finish the first manuscript it turned out to be. Mm-hmm. But I didn't know what it was, so I just filed it away on the computer. Mm-hmm. And then, oh gosh, that was in 2009 when I finished it. Okay. And then uh, in May of May of 2016. Yeah, May of 2016. We were in Massachusetts. And we went there on a moment's notice. And we, were, we expected to be there for two weeks. And we ended up there for two months. Mm-hmm. So one day, somebody comes to me. She says, I'm bored. <laughs> I said, and? She said, I need something to do. Again, my question is, and? <laughs> she says, can I read your book? And I said, I'm not finished with it. She goes, not the second one, the first one. I said, what first one? I have trouble with my memory. Mm-hmm. And she says, remember you told me you wrote a book? I said, I did. She said, yeah, you said you told me you wrote a book, um, like right before you met me. And I said, mm, well, I don't remember. So anyway, long story short, I, my computer had crashed like three times. So the individual who does the work on my computer he had simply backed all the files up and labeled it old, old computer or old files or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I searched the files for two days. I find the, 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 the manuscript and I copied it to a flash drive and I gave it to her and she went away. Mm-hmm. So three, four days later, she comes back. She goes, babe, I'm like, yeah, you can write. <laughs> okay. Considering the fact that I'm a weekly newspaper columnist, I, <laughs> that's a good thing. Yeah. But she, like, you had to do something with this. And I said, well, I, 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 I don't even know if it's published worthy. But when I started writing the book in 2006, yeah, I was, you know, the claim to fame. Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. Everybody sticks to the claim that they're a Christian. Mm-hmm. Well, most everybody. And I realized after meeting Sandra, uh, I realized <laughs> I've always been in church, but church hasn't always been in me. Mm. So mm-hmm. I had learned some things and honestly developed a closer relationship with the Lord than, than I had before ever. So I told her, I said, look, I finished, I finished, I finished writing this thing years before I met you. Though it's not, you know, it's not, it's not about my life. It's not an autobiography. Uh, I, I said, I don't want my, if it is published for me, I don't, I don't, I don't want my first published work to speak of my life or life before my accident, before my before my before my coming to know Christ. So I didn't change the story, but we returned to Jacksonville in June. 
we returned to, between June and December of 2016, I added another seven chapters to the book. Mm -hmm. The average page count was 30, 35 pages. So I went back and broke up the chapters where it made sense. So I reduced the average page count to 18 pages, and that extended the 28 chapters to, to 40 chapters. Mm -hmm. Then, to make a long story short, I was uh, I finally ended up with this one publishing company, and uh, it's a it's, it's a unique take on publication because if you're somebody and everybody knows you and they can make money off you, you go the traditional route. Mm -hmm. If you're nobody and nobody knows you, <laughs> mm -hmm. and you can come up with the money to do so, you go the self-publication route. Mm -hmm. But as, as a, a novice, I didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. So going the route of self-publication did make sense because they couldn't, they wouldn't tell me, teach me how to do it. Mm -hmm. Going the route of traditional publishing didn't work because they wouldn't take me. <laughs> right. Um, so then this, this, this. Company, um, I, I one day I'm on the computer and it just popped up. I don't even know where it came from. It just popped up, and as it turned out, this company called Author Academy Elite. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's termed an author assist publishing company, and it's it's literally like taking a a, a, a writing course in, in 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 college. They teach you everything from concept to complete. Even, 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 even aspects of marketing, um, 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 the, 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 the process of writing a book proposal in the event that you want to, you know, solicit, or I, I should say court traditional publishing companies. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, so, so I went through that process and it took me a good six, eight months. Um, and then. So long story short, a few months later, several months later, I got the finished work. And so, what is your what is your what is your first book entitled, and what is it about? Well, what happened um, when I got with this company? Um, they told me that the average word count they they measure the length of a book by word count, mm -hmm. and the average word count was eighty thousand words. Mm -hmm. My first manuscript was 174,000 words. Mm -hmm. So uh, I looked, reviewed it, uh, the, the the book again, went over it with the editor, and we determined that a good place to break the book was at the end of chapter 21. So if you read the first book, is 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 is, is through chapter 21, mm -hmm. and it worked out perfectly, ideally, because it's a complete book, but not a finished story. Right. However, if you read the first book and you don't read the second book, which I'm currently editing, I just finished editing it before yesterday, um, but if you read the first book and you don't read the second book, you won't miss anything. It's a, a complete book. Got it. Uh, if you read the second book, then it's the finished story. Mm -hmm. But like I said, I don't, I didn't, I didn't want to bait people and obligate them to purchase, you know, both books. And I had, had an individual yesterday ask me, but I thought you wanted to sell books. <laughs> I said, I do want to sell books, but more importantly than that, I want to sell good books. If it's not a good book, I don't want you to buy it. So what is the title of your first book? It is Family Ties, mm -hmm. Thicker Than Blood. And what is it about? Concerning a young man, his name is Willie LeBeau, mm -hmm. who coincidentally has, happens to be from South Georgia. And he moves to New York as an aspiring actor slash model mm -hmm. and I've had a couple of people ask me well why not 
have him go to California. That's more feasible. Because at the time he went to New York, that was just yeah, that's the only that was the only bus ticket that he could afford. So he goes to New York, and while in New York, he inadvertently saves the life of Oswald Jenkins, who happens to be a key figure in a notorious crime family. But you can't be an organized crime with a name like Oswald. Mm-hmm. So they call him Oz. Mm-hmm. So Willie basically becomes an understudy for Oz. Oz takes him under his wing, and he pretty much runs things for Oz. But that causes a problem between Anthony or Amp. Amp was second in command until Willie came on the scene. Mm-hmm. So now Amp has gripe with Willie. And without giving away too much information, Amp teams up with a former prodigy of Oz's by the name of Jerome. Mm -hmm. So Amp and Jerome team up, and there goes the power struggle uh, between Amp and Willie and trying to displace Oz. And things are further complicated when Willie inadvertently becomes involved with NYPD officer Ernestina Lake. But it sounds like there's a lot of chaos and mayhem that can ensue in all of that. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it, it helps to honestly, from the from the from 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 the perspective, excuse me, from the perspective of my writing, um, it mirrors real life. I'm I'm not, you know, I I I I I, I don't. I've had, I've had people debate the fact that you know when I say I'm Christian, they're like, how can you say you're Christian? And you write this stuff. It's not a. It's not a vulgar book. I mean, you know, there are adult situations. Mm-hmm. It's not vulgar. I mean, somewhat profane, but that's life. You can't live in. You don't have to live. You you can't walk down the streets in New York. And not hear somebody getting cursed out. If you're not careful, you get cursed out yourself. <laughs> right, right. So it's about life in the streets of New York, and he has uh, there. There are several dynamics that that I, I I liked about the book because, like I said, I didn't sit down with the idea of writing this book. It just started coming, and I just wrote what came. And you know, all jokes aside, I would literally sit down every day at the computer. And that's okay. Okay, Lord, here I am. What do you have for me? And I was just writing what came out. Well, that sounds like a book that was divinely inspired. And I know that people may take exception to that because it's not, you know, a Christian book per se. But (laughs) that sounds, to me, that sounds like a divinely inspired book. And I think that's, I mean, does that seem like a reasonable assessment to you? Well, and truthfully, that's what that's what I used to say. I mean, that that was my terminology. I was divinely inspired. But then, because of the content, I had someone suggest to me, "No, it wasn't divinely inspired. It was just therapy." <laughs> oh well, I'm gonna I'm gonna officially say here I disagree because I think one of the challenges we have in our society, particularly in the United States, where Christianity is almost politicized, mm. that is that you must you must be only thinking godly thoughts to be a true christian and that's not the case i i don't believe that to be the case i believe that i believe that if you are a human being existing on earth you're going to be thinking thoughts that are not what someone, especially by by U.S. modern U.S. standards, would consider to be Christian sometimes. That includes you might want to cuss out somebody who cut you off in traffic. And that includes, I mean, that is the nature of being human. We, you know, we aspire. I think I think I think that we aspire to be Christ like, but it doesn't mean that we are Christ like. And therefore and we don't even know what Christ like really means. That's just what somebody told us it meant. Right. So. I, I think it was divinely inspired. Every time I, I hear an author, and I've heard these kinds of things before. I myself have experienced it, not with um, a book, but with um, actually a course 
I had I I had what I would call a divine download, a spiritual download, where I was going to do something else, and I was literally redirected to grab some paper and start writing. And I started writing, and I wrote for like two hours and outlined an entire course. And it didn't almost didn't even feel like I had control of myself as that was happening. And that's why when you say this to me, it feels like the same type of thing. And I would say you were divinely inspired. Well, and it is really weird because when I can't write, like there was a period that my one one time that my 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 flash drive crashed. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, my my hard drive crashed. So I I contacted this guy. This guy named Randy. Um, he does all the work on my computer, but um, <laughs> I said to him, I said, Randy, I need you. <laughs> said, what's what's wrong? I said, my 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 something's wrong with my computer. So he's like, well, just bring it in. So I, I went over, um, so maybe about a 15, 15 minute drive from here. A little small, it's a little small place called GTI, and they they're not they're not big or affiliated with any maybe like um franchises they're just a you know one-stop shop but um so anyway i think i take the computer over there and he says i've got news and i got news <laughs> i said what do you mean and he said that's what he told me about you know the flash drive had crashed and i said no and and I, he literally let me borrow a computer <laughs> <laughs> He felt so bad. He feels so sorry for me. He let me literally, literally let me borrow a computer, and you know, so I can continue writing. Because like I keep a daily journal mm-hmm. because of the 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 loss of memory. Mm-hmm. I I I I'm, I'm like petrified of 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 that happening. And the the chances of it happening again is like one you know one in a billion. Right. But I'm petrified because I, I lost my memory and nobody could tell me about me. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and like, 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 like my, 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 my God sister said, you know, my life consisted of a lot of little, a great many little circles. And none of the circles ever intersected. So nobody knew, nobody knew, nobody knew who I was or who I am, was, am, me. So, so, so I wrestled with that. And it's like, you know, it petrified me. Um, and, 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 and then too with the, with the, with the, with the, stop. with the uh, condition, uh, the insepho, in, that, in, that, that, yeah, that word. Um, <laughs> it, um, well, and I couldn't say certainly, because I was like, what is this? I'm still trying to look at it. Encephalopathy. Did I get it close? Yeah, correct. In, okay. In, you have to break it. In yeah, I have to break it out. Encephalopathy. Okay. Encephalopathy. I have this written all wrong. E n c e p h a l o p a t h y. Okay. Encephalopathy. Thank you. But and with the condition, you said you were saying that it does it help with the condition do you have short-term memory things as well as the long-term memory gone i, I have to write everything down got it I, I i i write everything down and you know in the case where i need to need to need to need to need to remember i just go back and read about it because right. i because i can't because i can't because i can't and that that the speech impediment that's uh, a, a consequence of the of the condition as well, and it, you know it's, it's gotten a lot better because <laughs> it used to be so bad. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it used to be so bad to the point that the inside joke it would take me an hour and a half to watch sixty minutes. <laughs> you laugh. Most 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 people are afraid to laugh because they don't offend me. Well, I think it's you, you told a funny joke. I'm sorry. <laughs> I laugh at me all the time. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 one of the, one of the, one of the, one of the issues is my equilibrium is off. I have, I, I, I've fallen. Oh gosh, I can't even count the number of times I've fallen since my accident. Uh, but they said I would never walk again, so I, I consider it a blessing when I fall. <laughs> yeah, it, that's amazing. I, I think it's really amazing that you have been able to 
kind of become philosophical about this and you've picked a way to move forward. That to me is really inspiring. What would you say to, what advice would you give to someone who was struggling with their writing? Mm. Maybe even with, I mean, less of a challenge than you, you've dealt with. I think the first, I, I think I can't, I can't, I can't, I'm not in the habit of, of, of you know, one of my, I call them my twisted hillbilly philosophies because I'm, I'm from South Georgia. <laughs> but uh, one of my, one of my, one of my, one of my, one of my twisted hillbilly philosophies simply suggests live life in forward motion. Mm. Don't, 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 don't spend your time. Don't waste your time looking back because, because, because. 99.99% of it you can't change. So you're wasting your time looking back and you're losing time looking back and missing out on the on the present. But my 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 suggestion, I won't give anybody advice because <laughs> <laughs> my suggestion, um, um again, live 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 life in forward motion. Um don't 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 overthink it. It's like when you when you think about doing anything, whether it be uh, disassembling a, a car engine or or assembling a a, a, a a jigsaw puzzle, you do it one step at a time. So when it comes to writing, uh, and, 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 and 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 the weird thing, the weird thing, the weird thing, okay, peculiar thing. Um, I didn't go back and read research how to write a book until after I finished writing. Ah, okay. And once I got to the point of conclusion of the manuscript, I didn't even know what it was. I, I call it a manuscript now, but at that time I was just writing. But at the at the at the, at the, at the, at the, at the point that I concluded, the research suggested that you start out with the end in mind. Mm -hmm. Not. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, you you're supposed to outline the characters and you know uh, define situations and certain, that's not the way I wrote. I literally just sat down at the computer, opened the word document, and started typing. Well, I go back to divine inspiration. I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. So. Anybody who tells you you were not divine and divinely inspired, they can talk to me about it. I have something to say to them because I think you were. I will give them your email. You do. You do that. <laughs> I love. I love a good. I love a good argument with folks. People who know me will tell no. you Michelle will be gearing up for that one. No, you can't. You can't. You see, you, it does not benefit you to argue with anybody. No, you have, but you have, you have intense discussions. <laughs> yes, but well, you know what I mean by this. I mean, I really don't believe that anybody can tell anybody else what their spiritual experiences are. True. And whether or not they are in contact with the divine. And I believe that the divine inspires us in so many ways throughout the day, oh, throughout our lives. You may be you know, I became philosophical at one point, even about traffic. <laughs> in California? No, not in California. This is this is clearly something from not no. Uh, <laughs> but no, from the perspective that if if I got delayed, one of the, one of the things that I started to observe in Atlanta was if I got delayed getting out of the house in the morning, mm -hmm. let's say, there was usually a reason for it. Right. More than <laughs> once I got delayed and then I get to where I would have been 15 minutes earlier if I'd gotten out of the house on time and there was a bad traffic accident. Uh, yeah. I and did. when you observe these things over time, you realize that sometimes you're divinely inspired and you don't even realize it. And some that divine inspiration that morning might have been to go read a post on Medium or some, you know, 
go down the rabbit hole of Twitter for whatever reason. I don't know. <laughs> whatever it may have been that delayed me. Or maybe the kids got in, delayed. You know, they were divinely inspired to get caught up in something. And we ended up getting out of the house later. And who knows? We, that could have been us. So I believe that we are divinely inspired in so many ways, not just in the big things like writing a book, but also in the little things that you can't go around arguing with folks about, oh, you couldn't have been divinely inspired. God would never have inspired you to do that. <laughs> I think I think God has inspired plenty of people to be late for appointments. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't want you to have that job anyway. <laughs> that was going to be a bad opportunity for you. And so rather than let you get caught up in that foolishness, he, he took that out of your hands. You know, different things like that. I, th I believe we get divinely inspired in so many ways, and some of the ways may seem to be not good, but mm -hmm. everything is always working out for us. And clearly, despite this really unusual, it's pretty rare for, I think, for full amnesia to take hold. Um, I think, isn't that true that most people do get some portion of their memories back after right. some time? That is true. That is true. Um, you know I what? I, you've done an outstanding job pulling yourself together into a new life and creating something new for yourself. Um, I just look up and say thank you. <laughs> That's it's awesome. nothing I could have done by myself. I, I just look up, I couldn't have done it at all. I just look up and say thank you. That's amazing. That's yeah. really amazing. Well, yeah. I am, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Um, why don't you tell people where they can find you, where they can find your books? how they can connect with you on social media and, and so forth? Well, um, because of the current pandemic, um, I had to take a different route as far as the, uh, the marketing aspect. So I never had one before, mm -hmm. but now I maintain a presence on basically all the social media, the major social media platforms like Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and LinkedIn, and, uh, Pinterest and, um, but the easiest way to find me, um, on Facebook, I'm BG Howard mm -hmm. on, oh gosh, can't remember all these things. Facebook, I'm BG Howard on LinkedIn. I'm BG, what? BG Howard. BG Howard as well. Um, Instagram, I am BG Howard 1228. On Pinterest, I am confused. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, on Pinterest, I'm BG Howard as well. Mm -hmm. um, and on Twitter, I am. I'm at BG Howard too. At, at BG Howard too. Right. And do you have a website? It's um, bghoward.com. Any so spaces have, or anything like that? It's just bghoward.com. No spaces, all, right? All, all lowercase, bghoward.com. Perfect. And is your book available on Amazon or should they go to bghoward.com to purchase? Um, you can go to amazon.com. Mm -hmm. uh, Barnes and Noble. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. The most popular Amazon.com, Barnes and Noble, and okay, on Amazon is www.amazon.com forward slash author forward slash BG Howard, no spaces. Mm -hmm. um, all lowercase. On uh, Barnes and Noble, it's www.barnesandnoble.com. And just look for BG Howard. Um, there's also a platform called Book Depository. Mm -hmm. Bookdepository.com. Um, and Goodreads. Goodreads.com. Awesome. And also, awesome. If, you, if you're if you French, <laughs> <laughs> www.f like Frank, n like Nancy, a like Apple, c like cat.com. All right. And that's for the French folks. All you French speakers out there. <laughs> awesome. BG Howard, 
thank you so much for appearing on Somewhere in the Middle with Michelle Barrard. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Barrard, for having me. I appreciate your time and uh, your confidence. Now, I know some of you have been wondering, where is Julia Black? I mean, we miss Julia. I know. But Julia and I have been working on something new and exciting. And it's really in response to everything that's been going on here. We recently started a live stream called Shelter in Place, hashtag Pandemic 2020. You can find us on Saturdays live. And you can get there by going to HTTPS rebrand.ly well you know all the slash slash stuff rebrand.ly slash shelter in place live stream so make sure that you check out the live stream we're there on saturdays at 1 30 pacific 1 30 p.m pacific 4 30 p.m eastern shelter in place hashtag pandemic 2020 again https colon slash slash rebrand.ly slash shelter in place live stream. That's where you can find me chatting with Julia on Saturdays. So that's our show this week, guys. You can reach out to me online at urbanbookeditor.com or michelleberard.com. You can also find me on Facebook and Instagram as Urban Book Editor. Send me a note. I'd love to hear from you. Feel free to send in some topics you'd like us to cover on the show. Make sure you tune into the show on September 25th, when my guest will be author and grant writing expert, Dr. Beverly A. Browning. You can find us twice a month on Fridays at 5 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Mountain, 7 p.m. Central, and 8 p.m. Eastern at the Somewhere in the Middle Podcast.com. Let's continue the conversation. You guys be good, stay mindful, and remain prayerful. Peace and blessings, y'all.